So I just wanted to have you on the show because I think that the state of podcasting is just, it's so interesting right now. Looking at the companies being bought and sold, I believe it's a lot of different shakeups happening. I've even seen some people leaving the industry that are just all together shutting things down. So with you being such a veteran in the podcast space, how do you see 2023 happening? Do you have any big predictions for the year? I don't know. I think all I can look at really is from a historical perspective of what I've been through during uncertain economic times, because we've had them before in the podcasting medium, like back in the 2008, 2009 timeframe during the kind of housing problem. And then back in the 2004 timeframe also was a time of war. Uh, that's when we invaded Iraq. And so we saw some a little bit of retraction in the podcasting market to some degree and a little bit of uncertainty. But overall, if you look at it, podcasting has been fairly, what I would call resilient, I guess might be the best word to describe it because it's always been a, a little bit of an indie market. It's been an open ecosystem and it hasn't been entirely reliant on economic situations for its mm -hmm. success and in viability. Most of the content in podcasting historically and currently is free content. So people aren't having to pay anything to get access and listen to content that they have an interest in. So I think that the economic impacts are really around people that have built businesses around podcasting and ones that have invested large sums of money over the last four or five years, more specifically in podcasting, yeah. they have expectations for getting a return on their investment. And so we just may be going through a time period here for the next six months where things may get a little tight. And we've seen companies decide that they're going to close down their doors or change their business models. And we've seen this all happen before. So I'm not as concerned about it. I think we will weather this pretty well. But I do think that the advertising market isn't going to grow as fast as has been predicted for the last four or five years that it's going to be like yeah. a multi-billion multi dollar advertising market for podcasting. But that may come after we've come through this. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That advertising market, if you look up anything on that, it's it's growing X percent every year. Right. It's doing so well. It never gets there. <laughs> it, it just, it's a little extra hype. Yeah. Honestly. Oh, it's um, definitely a lot of hype. It's definitely people like to be positive and want to project opportunity and what they see is growth. And everybody wants to come across as being the, um, the soothsayer of growth and prosperity. And so I'm not surprised that happens. And that's happened in the past in the podcasting medium too. And it just has to be matched up at some point with reality and <laughs> the current reality is that the advertising market isn't growing really much right now. The CPM models, as far as the amount are, that's being paid per thousand listeners, is actually staying pretty constant. The issue and what a lot of people don't talk about is that the number of campaigns that are being run has dropped. And so when it comes to that advertising, I know that the independent podcasters are the ones who don't really generate a lot of that revenue. They're the ones who struggle the most. The networks do pretty well in terms of generating revenue and having those campaigns. And I've been a part of networks. I've ran a network, so I know it's yeah. way easier than yeah. if you're independent. So what do you tell to those independent podcasters, the people who are out there doing the show alone and they produce and they edit everything? What do you tell them when they come to you about monetizing? Right now, I think, and if I think back to other economic declines where we've seen a lot of the big media companies pull out of podcasting and maybe get a little back off from their investment in podcasting, I think it presents an opportunity for indie podcasters to to capture more listeners because there's less kind of big media or big branded, big marketing mm. budget driven content out there in the market. So I think that there's an opportunity increasingly as we move into this difficult time to, it's a great time to start a show. There's not as many new shows being launched right now. I think that the audience is continuing to, or at least stay fairly constant. So I think that the opportunity is more probably stronger now for indie podcasters than it has been over the last few years. 
Yeah, I think the indie hosts just need more in terms of building a show that has the right structure and right. taking advantage of the right opportunities and even just having the right podcasting models. Right. Because yeah. if you ask them what kind of show they're going to have, oh, I'm going to interview this celebrity and I'm going to get sponsored by this company. And that just isn't the right model for everybody. Sometimes I think it's, it's kind of that model has come and gone to some degree. I yeah. think you have to think about your content a little bit differently now to stand out. I think that the relying on the interview model is is not going to grow your audience as much unless you have big name folks that are on your podcast. And I think I think a lot of people see like a Joe Rogan and they say, well, I'm just going to do the same thing Joe Rogan does and I'm going to achieve his level of success. It's difficult to do. Joe's been doing his show since probably 2008 or nine. So he's built a reputation and he's built an audience and a following and things like that. So to just replicate what Joe does is necessarily a formula for success. I think you have to do things that are unique and different, maybe get more niche in your yeah. topics and really have a lot of passion for it and try and build community. And I think that's the part that's hard, but it's also the part that pays the dividends in the end is oh, building yeah. a reputation, building your personal brand and building community around what you're doing and getting in front of people in the real world as much as possible. And I agree with you on that wholeheartedly. I, I'm literally recording this in the library right now. Oh, uh, yeah. awesome. <laughs> so it's not my usual setting the audience is used to seeing, but this is part of my process because back before COVID, I was doing local workshops on podcasting yeah. uh, here in Seattle. And oh, you're in Seattle. I'm actually from Seattle originally. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. So yeah, I'm up here and I've been doing the workshops and I'm doing more and I'm doing more in-person interviews. And for me, it's a great foundation setter for not only mm -hmm. my show, but also for my business because I do have podcast software. So ah, for right. me, if I do a workshop twice a month at a library that's free, let's say it's an hour and a half, that's three hours of my time, I can generate users from that. If you're a new podcaster, if you're a veteran, you can come through and learn something and then you go and check out the software. Here's a promo code, you know, and I build those connections that way in person. Yeah, and I think that's awesome. That's awesome to, to connect with people in the real world. I think that's the big thing that all of us struggle with, especially on the hosting platforms, is being able to actually have one-on-one -on -one pathways. Because it as we've so grown powerful. as a medium, the scale of things have gotten larger and it's put more of a challenge on a lot of the hosting platforms to be able to have that personal touch. And I know that's what I try and do by getting on as many podcasts as I can get on and speaking at as many conferences and going to as many conferences as I can too, is just getting in front of people in the real world to answer their questions and to be, be available and be a resource to, to help. And that's what I built my whole career on. I've been in the podcasting medium since the whole thing started. So that's what I've done. <laughs> yeah, I try to advise people to do that and they're always terrified. They're like, how do I do this? And where do I find an event space? And I'm like, you could do something as simple as, yeah. again, get the free library space. It's well, just free. Do it local. That, get started locally. doing it local, just like what you are. There's and nothing wrong with they that. They think that you have to do podcast or podcast movement. And I'm like, look, you can start <laughs> off. I, my first event I had locally yeah. was actually in LA and I had six people there. And that was it. But it was yeah. amazing. That's how we all should start because you don't even know what to do if I gave you 500 people. <laughs> well, yeah, honest. that's a lot of people, actually. A lot of people think, oh, if I get 100 downloads, that, that's failure or something like that. How often do you get to present in front of 100 people? Really, at the end of the day, 100 people is significant and you should be able to build on that. You know, I used to put on meetups in Seattle, in downtown Seattle, for many years for podcasting back when I lived out there and I used to work for the small company, Microsoft and ran podcasting there for them. And so doing things local was important to me back then. And then I've worked with the podcast movement. I went to the very first conference that they had and they had a, just a couple hundred people there. You have to start out small in order to get big, but it takes time and podcast movement's been around now for what, almost 10 years. So, yeah. you know, that's the pattern that you see in this medium is that people that start and continue doing stuff over a long period of time achieve a certain amount of reach and awareness in the podcasting space and thus some level of success. Yeah, I 100% agree, man. And I think that's where patience comes in, yeah, it does. which 
in my podcast launch course, and I give this away free, by the way, one lesson is patience. Yeah. I just patience want more and consistency. Podcasts. That's it. It's so important because if you want to, I run into so many people that are like, hey, I want you to help me monetize my show and get launched in three months. And I'm like, right. there's a possibility, but you have to be patient because it may not take three months. It could take six months. It probably is going to take a year. That's just the yeah. reality of most podcasts. And you have to it be is. patient through that process. But I do think that the expectations have elevated and, mm -hmm. and people think that they can just launch a show and reach a six-figure income out of the show in the first couple months or something like that. And that's an un <laughs> unreasonable expectation of what, what can be accomplished. It's possible mm -hmm. if you've built a community around your personal brand or your company outside of podcasting and then you just hop into podcasting it may be possible to do that it just depends on lots of factors of your talent and your ability to connect with people in a podcast it's a special talent that you have to acquire over time to understand how to speak to an audience that then will build loyalty and build mm -hmm. a connection really build friendships. And that's what you're creating by creating a podcast is that you're building a network or a community of friends. You know, it's so funny. Whenever I tell people that podcasting is a skill, like if you buy a microphone, you get all the equipment, that's good, but you still need the skill. It's a skill. And it is. I have a hard time explaining how you build that skill of being able to do interviews. And if you do solo content, being able to talk to yourself for 20 minutes, it's, it's a not true easy skill. to be a solo caster. I don't think you have to have a lot of self-confidence and you have to have the ability to be able to think quickly and to be able to keep a coherent thought and be engaging and entertaining and have some vocal frequency range and to keep people awake. <laughs> yeah. That's part of it. And a lot of comments is that you don't want to be boring in your podcast either, because that's going to cause people to tune out. So you have to drive value. You have to be entertaining. You have to be providing good insights into whatever topic that you're talking about. And that will translate into connection and further engagement and growth. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it just takes time to get that. And I, I try to tell people to get your community building strategies. And I think we should have two, one that's in the real world and one that's virtual. For me, virtual is my workshops where I can just teach yep. people. And it's a unique thing because I can tie that into my software. So I've created an incredible ecosystem for myself. And then virtually, I like to just have conversations with podcasters every day. I just talk to people about their shows. Hey, what's going on with your show and how long have you been hosting? I think that having conversations with even your listeners is the best way to build a community. Oh yeah, it is. Get their input, get their communication. It's I've done a lot of live shows too. And I, I think what you will know once you've reached a certain amount of community, when the community knows each other outside of you as the host, <laughs> when they're right, when they become friends with each other and they come and listen to your show, especially if it's a live show at a certain time, on a certain day, because they want to connect with the other listeners. I've seen that dynamic happen too. Not all podcasting has that happen, but it's certainly something in the podcast 2.0 new namespace that we're working on this whole lit tag. And there's a lot of talk about creating a commenting thread that is shared across listening apps. So you can hmm. basically have community that is talking to each other around an episode that then is shared across multiple listening apps. So I like know, that. that's, that's a development that's coming. And I think that's a big area for podcasting that will help elevate this aspect of community. I think and I'm, what you just mentioned is so interesting because... I've been trying to force that. Like I'm trying to figure out how to do that with my episodes on Twitter right. because Twitter is one of the few places where it's public and anybody can chime in on the conversation. That's true. I think that's something that every podcast should be trying to do. If you record an episode and you review movies, you could put your episode and your movie review as a main tweet and ask people what they think about it. You can put a poll and just start a conversation yeah. because that's going to get the engagement up. Things like StreamYard, whatever, that they have ability to integrate Twitter <clears throat> posts into your live stream. They'll flash across the screen if you flag it to be displayed. It, that kind of interaction with your audience, it's fun. And it also helps you come up with topics that maybe you hadn't thought of. Oh, yeah. To, to talk sure. about that really connects with your audience. Because if the audience is thinking about it, 
it's an important thing for them. So you need to talk about it. <laughs> One yeah. thing I could not wait to ask you about was YouTube for podcasters. YouTube seems to be making a ton of strides. And I just love what they're doing so far because if we look over at what Facebook did for podcasters, it seemed really lackluster and lazy. Yeah. So yeah, I'm I excited to see yeah. YouTube is already making strides. They put out like a 50 page guide on how you can like podcast on YouTube and it was incredible. So how do you see YouTube changing podcasting in the next coming years? Yeah, I think we're going to see a lot more out of YouTube around podcasting here in the next year or the next couple of years. I, I think they're going to put forth quite a bit of effort in there. Now, granted, podcasting has always been pretty tightly woven with YouTube since the very early days of the medium. A lot of new people to podcasting don't realize, but in the early days of podcasting, video podcasting was actually probably a third of the podcasting market. That's a truly mm. an, a video podcast. So that is the equivalent to really basically an MP4 file in a yeah. separate RSS feed from your audio feed, which is the MP3 feed. And then when YouTube launched in, was it 2007 or so, and Google acquired them, more and more of the video podcasters started to post all their videos over to YouTube. So we started to see that movement start to happen back then that really caused a decline in video podcasting. So YouTube has always been a significant player in this space. But the last, the more recent developments is that the research is starting to show that people are finding podcasts yeah. on YouTube in a significant way now. But the truth of it is that a lot of the shows that people think is a podcast on YouTube aren't really podcasts. So <laughs> they're just YouTube shows and people perceive it as a podcast. And so that's, so more and more what we're seeing is that the perception on the listener side or the viewer side is viewing podcasting as being something that is, it's, it's a different kind of content now. Now it includes YouTube, it includes StreamYard, it includes these live experiences too. Those are considered a podcast when podcasting in its kind of technical definition is an on-demand file that's downloaded. So more and more with modern technology, we've evolved podcasting to mean a lot more now. So it includes live shows and includes, there's more and more people calling what's going on like a TikTok or a Reels or something like that as a form of a podcast. So the Clubhouse. definitions are definitely widening on yeah. what a podcast is. And I love the discovery aspect of YouTube because that right there is something like if you post YouTube shorts, you could have one video that gets a couple hundred views and you'll have other videos that get thousands within minutes. It's insane. So yeah, it is. if that's a clip from your show, that could be the way that, you know, a short goes viral. You get 10,000 views in five minutes out of those 10,000 people, a hundred of them can go and start listening to your show. Yeah. And that could be the way you get discovered. So I just think it's a great way to use discoverability for the audio format of the podcast. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's a huge opportunity. I've seen the same thing with things that I posted to TikTok or whatever. They just blow up and I'm, an, I'm not a, a young TikToker or something like that. And it still <laughs> does pretty well. Yeah, I think using these platforms, see, I think where the tension is that people are using these platforms as their platform, right? They're just doing TikTok. And then there's other folks that are doing a podcast and they're doing it, maybe they're doing video as well. And then they're snipping pieces out of their video podcast and publishing those onto TikTok or Reels or the shorts platforms. So you can go still at the end of the day, you as a content creator need to decide what's your primary platform yeah. that you want to specialize in and to grow your community. And is it via RSS or is it via TikTok or is it via YouTube? And the question that then you have to ask yourself is how do I leverage these other platforms to support my primary, which would be whatever that primary is. Is it TikTok or is it YouTube or is it podcasting? And how do you support the others to build on whatever platform? And now you've got like Rumble and some of these other ones now that are starting to pick up a lot of steam, people are starting to create content over there because they feel like they can speak more freely <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> on yeah. topics, right? Yeah. I've been seeing it. So I, I think that it's a good balance for us, man. It, for me, I love it because YouTube having competition, I believe is just healthy. 
because then they're forced to innovate and make changes. That's I think the thing with Twitter with, too. Yeah. There's the Mastodon platform now that seems to be picking up a lot of steam and people are, that's going to be probably having some connection with podcasting too, with this new podcasting 2.0 namespace. There's talk about it right now. Well, the discussions that could happen on Mastodon could be shared with the podcast RSS feed and then shared across all the all these new up and coming listening apps that are supporting all those new tags. It's going to be interesting to see how this thing develops over the next couple of years. Yeah, I love this space that we're in because it's a lot of growth and innovation. And I think that's what industry needs to evolve. Let me ask you this. I've been having debates with people the past couple of months about should you become a YouTuber or a podcaster? And it's really hard to debate on the monetization front because we know Google AdSense pays YouTubers billions of dollars a year. In your opinion, do you see that changing for podcasters? Do you see anything like a Google AdSense to pay podcasters more consistently in the future? Yeah. Uh, actually, most of the hosting platforms right now, the platform I'm working for now is Podbean. And we are building out a what's called a programmatic automatic advertising platform, which has been built by Lipson and Spreaker. And a lot of the hosting platforms are building in automated advertising um, capabilities. So that's been growing and expanding. And what we're going to see is those type of opportunities are going to be made available to basically all levels of shows. Uh, it's still going to be the same kind of a dynamic as like a YouTube where the larger the show, the more revenue you're going to be able to make. That incentive is still there. It isn't like a show with 10 downloads is going to make $1,000 a month. It's not quite going to be like that, but you do need to continue building your audience, building your community. And I do believe podcasting have opportunities like this. And the Podcasting 2.0 initiative also has monetization capabilities built into it too. That's going to be, it's currently focused on like a, let's call a Satoshi, which is basically a derivative trading coin of Bitcoin. So that is also being used as a trading token between hosts and listeners and the listening apps get a little cut of that too. So there's a way of funding in the ecosystem uh, through these new tags and the podcasting 2.0 initiative. Wow. See, this is why I want to have you on the show because you could speak to all of this stuff and I don't know enough. I know a little bit, but yeah, <laughs> hopefully but not that much, you know. I mean, it's new and developing things right, right now that are that have been building in the podcasting space. And I think it was triggered based on some criticism that the founder of Anchor, um, his name is Michael, and he got acquired by Spotify and was critical of the podcasting industry and felt like we need to move on from RSS because it, there wasn't enough innovation in RSS. So I think that triggered Mr. Adam Curry, who's the godfather of podcasting and the podcasting index, Dot org project to say, let's take the bull by the horn and not be dependent on Apple to innovate for us and dictate new namespace tags, which is what they've always done. So we as an industry need to come together and say, what do we want to do? And force the hand with these big listening platforms to say, either, either join us or you're going to be replaced. <laughs> mm, yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good, good strategy. Yeah. And so that's what's starting to happen is that there's a group of up and coming podcast listening apps that are embracing these innovative tags that are doing a lot of interesting things with podcasting now. And it's going to be up to these big platforms to say, do I fall behind or do I keep up with what the industry wants? And that's the challenge before the industry right now is we're calling the bluff of these big platforms to say, you complain that there's no innovation. So when are you going to participate in the innovation? I like that. I like that. So we've talked about a lot here. I love these conversations because it just covers so much in such a short time and gives people a lot to think about and a lot to look forward to. But before we go, I always like to get a controversial podcast opinion from my guest. Could be anything, could be small, could be large, just a controversial opinion that most people probably wouldn't agree with you on. 
I don't know that not everybody would agree with me, but I think that there's still a lot of skepticism out there about the influence and the influx of artificial intelligence into the podcasting space. There's been a lot of talk about automating certain processes using artificial intelligence, AI technology. There's a lot of heated and passionate interest out there around technologies that can automate the creation of show notes, chapters, even artwork and even music just by typing a description into a, like a search field. Really, I think AI technology and the way it's being deployed right now and how it's being experimented right now is causing folks like Google to say, or Microsoft or some of these bigger platforms to say like, well, wait a minute, we need to do something different here because this is a whole nother level of search, right? That's That they haven't explored, right? And if you type into a search field in one of these AI platforms and it will generate a unique piece of artwork or a unique piece of music or generate your show notes or whatever, I mean, sky's the limit about what is capable here. Yeah. And when you Google stuff now, it's like you have to go through a ton of long blogs and yeah, a lot and of extra ads information. and all it's, sorts of stuff. Right. It's distracting. It's frustrating too, because you really get the answer you were looking for on page three, but the so many ads and so many other blogs that might have a better web page or a better header or something like that get yeah. ranked higher than the one with the good information. If the running joke about recipes, if you find a recipe, you have to go through a full on essay to find the actual recipe. And that's just Yeah, there's all these ads that are in there too. And it's that's what's really interesting about these new AI tools is that they're they get you what you are looking for and there it's customized to to what you're looking for. I think that there is some danger, and I've talked about this on a couple other podcasts too, but of duplication, right? So if people are too generic in their requests of AI, it could generate the same output, right? So I think you have to be detailed in your description of what you want to be able to get really customized output. So I think that's the key thing to think about with utilizing any of these tools is that if you're too generic with it, it's going to give you generic output. But if you want customized, more customized output, you have to give it more customized information. Yeah, man, I 100% agree, man. So I think that will be controversial because most people are just jumping on the AI bandwagon. Yeah, I love it. It's perfect. Use it for everything. <laughs> Well, it's so going to change I, it, a lot of stuff and how a lot of people think about workflows. And I'm starting to think that there could be even a platform created that would automate the whole podcasting process, except for maybe your recording, but the whole, the rest of it <laughs> could just be automated by artificial intelligence and that may be coming. So, Man, it was great talking to you, Rob. Great as always. Thank you for being here. Let people know where they can find you and support your work. Actually, I have a website, robgreenlee.com, and that's with two E's on the end. And I'm currently working for Podbean at podbean.com. So I'm the P of content and partnerships for them. I've only been with Podbean for about a month and a half now. I was with Lipson for the last four years and Spreaker prior to that. So I've been in the medium a long time, but that's the best way. And then if you want to send me an email, you can send it to robg at podbean.com. Happy to hear from you.